the last video, we uh, took a look at the definitions of angular velocity and angular acceleration, and ultimately used that to come up with expressions for tangential velocity. Um, here, we're going to continue looking at things moving in a circle and come up with an expression for the uh, um, for the acceleration. We've already seen in a prior video that the acceleration points to the uh, center of the circle. So here I've, I'm taking a look at an object that's moving clockwise around and I want to know the acceleration at the very top here. Um, so I've marked off three positions, one position before the point at the top, one position right after, equal amounts of time, so we're sweeping equal angles. These vectors are the position vectors, and I've already marked off the displacements. Remember, displacement is telling you how to get directly from one point to the other in a straight line. So we can go ahead and check that check out that say delta r1 is equal to um, r2 minus r1. So here would be my r2 and actually let me put the label over here and I can add to that a negative r1 and that would indeed be my delta r and this angle is that angle. Okay, now here I've got my delta r's. So we can go ahead and look at them. And similarly, we can say, all right, I'll take my delta r, whoops, sorry. So my delta r2 point down to the right um, means that I have to have a, uh, my velocity pointing down and to the right at that point. So this would be my V2. Oops. V2. And similarly, V1 would point up and to the right. So I subtract at negative V1. It would point down and to the left, giving me a delta V, like so. And then we know that the acceleration always points in the same direction as delta V. So we worked out like before, so I went over this a little quickly, that um, the acceleration points to the center of the circle like we saw in an earlier video. Now, it shouldn't take a whole lot of convincing to, a whole lot of work to convince yourself that this angle is also the same as these angles here. So now we can start to relate these things. We can say, for instance, that delta R2 um, would be equal to, oops, make that purple, um, would be equal to V2 times delta T. And similarly, um, oops, what am I saying? Try that again. Delta R would be equal here. This would be my V1 delta T. All right. And similarly here, we can say that my delta V would be equal to A delta T. And these are the definitions of velocity and acceleration. So now we can play a game with similar triangles. Well, we can say that the V1 and, although the V2, V1 and V2 are not the same because their directions are different, their magnitudes are the same. So we can say the magnitude is just plain V. So we can say that delta V is 2V, as in the same deal here, although R1 and R2 are not the same um, vectors, they are the same length R as delta R is to R. All right. Now here we can do just a little bit of a cheat. Um, 
what we can do, so we'll go ahead and say that delta V is equal to A delta T. Like so. So A delta T is to V. Yes, now with the delta R, this is going to be an approximate statement, but it becomes an equality for short enough time periods. This delta R is in a straight line. Delta S, the arc length traveled, is in a curved line. I'm going to approximate my delta R with delta S. Um, and this is actually legit. Um, because as the angles get smaller and smaller, um, so we'll start first with a big angle. With a big angle, the difference between the arc length and the radius is, gets huge. But if the angle is small, the difference between arc length and radius is not so much. And you can show rigorously that as the angle approaches zero, the difference goes away. And since we're going to be letting our times go, um, our, our times approach zero, eventually this delta S will be equal, it will approach delta R. So this is legit. But what this lets me do, let me multiply both sides through by a, a um, by V and divide through by delta T. So this will give me A is equal to um, V um, over R times delta S, but now I divide by delta T and oh hey, that's the speed. So we get that the acceleration um, is V squared over R. So when you're going around in a circle at constant speed, you accelerate into the center of the circle, and the magnitude of that acceleration is V squared over R. So the faster you go, the bigger the acceleration, the tighter the churn, the bigger the acceleration. And again, this is directed perpendicular to the motion, so we're not changing the speed. Now, it's useful to um, remember that V is equal to R omega. So if we make that substitution, that A sub C is, that V is R omega, this will become R squared omega squared over R, cancel, cancel. And you can also write that the centripetal acceleration is equal to r omega squared. I personally find these expressions to be um, equally useful on about almost a 50-50 split. So again, just as a quick reminder for how the angular units work, if you're checking your units here, you might be a a little concerned because the left hand side is meters per second squared. This is meters from the radius. Then you have radians per second that you then are squaring. And you might think, oh, this isn't working out, but radians squared is one squared, which is one. And so again, it's all okay. So remember, we only ever use the radian as a placeholder for reminding ourselves that's an angular quantity. And when it ceases being an angular quantity, we just drop the radian accordingly. So let's just do a couple quick examples of this to <coughs> get some feel for how this might work. So here, we're going to be looking down at just a washer that I have tied to a string. And we're going to say that we're letting this move around in a circle of radius 10 centimeters. We'll say that the washer has a mass of 10 grams. Um, and we'll say that this string will break if the load exceeds 50 newtons. With all that, <coughs> we want to know what's the maximum possible speed that the washer could be going. Well, 
we can go ahead and draw a free body diagram for our washer. Um, all we've got is the tension from the string pointing into the center. Now there will be a force of gravity into the screen and a normal force out of the screen, but they cancel out and we're not, so there's no motion in the plane, so we're just kind of neglecting those for the moment. So, okay, Newton's second law will tell me then that since this is my, th that the net force is my tension, I can say that that's equal to the mass of the washer times its acceleration. But since we know it's going in a circle, we know that that acceleration is also v squared over r. So I can say v squared is tr over m, or that the speed of the washer will be t root tr over m. So we can, whoops, sorry about that. So we can go ahead and put the values in for our maximum speed, we would get that V is the square root of 50 newtons. Now I said it was a 10 gram washer, so you're going to have to convert that to kilograms, 0 0.010 kilograms. Um, oops, sorry, and that goes in the denominator. There we go. And the radius we said was uh, 10 centimeters, so I'll have to convert that to meters and go 0 0.1 meters. Okie dokie. So we will get twenty two point four. meters per second. So that can be whipping around pretty good. All right, and so a bonus thought here is ask yourself what would the path of the washer be after the string breaks? So pause and think about that for a second. All right. So I hope you then said, oh, hey, there's no net force. So by Newton's second, by Newton's first law, um, the washer would be moving in a straight line at a constant speed. So my washer would be going in a straight line um, at 22.4 meters per second. Okay. Let's finish this one up with a slightly more complicated example. Um, this one usually gets the name conical, the conical pendulum. And although it, you're not letting it swing like a pendulum, the punchline is that the thing orbits at the, has the orbital period that's the same as a pendulum swing. So here what I'm imagining is I've got myself a uh, wash, a stopper here that's tied to a string and I'm and that strings attached to the ceiling and I'm just letting it go around in a horizontal circle and just to make the numbers easy let's say that this is a radius of one meter we know and we'll say that my bob is moving around in a horizontal plane at five meters per second what I'd like to know is what is the angle that the string is making with respect to the vertical. Now at first this may look absolutely horrendous, but it's not as bad as you might fear. Again, if we draw a free body diagram, we'll have the tension due to the string point up and to the right, and the force of gravity pointing straight down. And this angle here would also be that same angle theta over there. So I can go ahead and write down Newton's laws of motion in x and y, and let's start with the y first. Um, 
So the y component of the tension will be t times the cosine of theta. From that, I'll subtract fg. And that'll equal m a sub y. But a sub y is 0 because the washer is going in a horizontal circle, so it's not bobbing up or down. All right, so we can rearrange this, get that t cosine theta is equal to the force of gravity, but the force of gravity is equal to mg. So, okay, that's as far as we can take that for the moment. Let's go over to the land of x. The only force or piece of a force that's acting in x is the x component of tension. That's equal to t sine theta. That'll be equal to m a sub x. But here's the trick. Again, you're moving in a circle. So you know what the acceleration is. You know that it is equal to v squared over r. So yeah, you're right. I didn't mention the mass, what the mass was. Hopefully that cancels. So anyway, our goal is to find the angle, but we have this unknown of the tension. And again, you could solve one of these for the tension, stick it into the other, and that's fine. But just to show you another trick, just like before when I subtracted equations, here you can divide the equations. So you can say t sine theta on the left would be equal to mv squared over r on the right. If I divide the left by t, I can divide the left by t cosine theta, as long as I divide the right by t cosine theta, which I will, in the form of mg. The t's cancel, and it turns out it doesn't matter how massive my stopper is. Sine over cosine is tangent. And so this is, we get that the tangent theta is equal to v squared over rg. So then my angle will be the arc tangent. So taking the arc tangent both sides, I get that my angle is v squared over rg. So this will be the arc tangent of 5 meters per second squared over 1 meter times 9.8 newtons per kilogram. which I will immediately rewrite as meters per second squared. So again, it's always useful to be super careful checking your units here. Meters squared over second squared in the numerator. OK, I have over second squared in the denominator, so that helps. Meters times meters, OK, I have meters squared in the denominator. So all my units cancel, which is good, because if I take an inverse trig function of something, that something better not have any units because I don't know what the arc tangent of a meter is. And anyway, it turns out that the angle is 68.6 degrees. By the way, as a fun fact, um, this is how airplanes actually turn in a circle. The rudder is only there to make sure that the aircraft um, that that the aircraft is turning around its axis at the same rate it's turning around, um, going around in a circle, um, what pilots call a, a coordinated turn. Um, and that's just to keep the velocity vector tangential to the circle. The way the aircraft actually turns the circle is to go into a bank. And so the only difference is that instead of a force due to tension, you have the lift from the wings, but it's exactly the same thing. All right, I need to finish this one out. Just mentioning briefly fictitious forces. Mostly the pinky swear that we'll never do them again. And I'll put the forces in quotation marks. Um, so unfortunately, most books at this point feel compelled to mention them. And they mention them just enough to make things even more confusing than, than they, were, they already were. 
and my attitude is that fictitious forces are just best left out but if you're going to mention them then you need to go a little more into detail so for instance if you're thinking about driving your car around a curve um, so the car is going around the curve um, let me just draw the car at some later frames here by Newton's first law of motion, the way you would want to go would be out towards the side of the car. So you think of that as, you can even convince yourself that you're feeling like you're being thrown to the outside of the curve, but that's not what's actually happening. What's actually happening here is that um, as the car is accelerating to the center of the curve, you're trying to go in a straight line. So something has to make you accelerate. That something is going to be your car seat and lap belt. So as you're sitting there, um, your car seat and lap belt are going to be exerting a force on your, on your butt to make you in toward the center of the circle to make your uh, butt move in the center of the circle. Um, so I'm going to make a ridiculously long spine here and I'm deliberately tilting it off angle. What's going to make your head accelerate to the center of the circle? Well, it's attached to your spine. So what happens is your spine actually elongates a little bit. That gives you a force due to tension in the spine that's directed like so. And the X component, the uh, tension of the force due to tension is what's whipping it in. Now your head, now, now your nervous system isn't going to be able to tell why your spine is getting stretched. It just knows that your spine is getting stretched. And so it interprets that as a sensation of being thrown out. Now it turns out that in more advanced treatments in physics, um, we can ease up on the restriction of saying that only an inertial observer can do physics. And when you ease up on those restrictions, it turns out that you have to introduce four what we call fictitious forces. One of these is the so-called centrifugal force, which is what we would identify with that sensation of being feeling thrown outside. But in an introductory treatment, my approach is that we stay, that, that we only ever let inertial observers do physics, and then we don't have to worry about this at all. So with that, I will catch you in the next video where we'll introduce Newton's Law of Universal Gravitation.